Roger Bell is a founding professor of engineering at UC Merced, and he's been active in water and climate-related research for over 30 years. With that, Roger, I'll turn over to you to make your presentation. Thank you very much. I'm really to be able to share some of the results of our research and some of the plans that my uh, many collaborators and I have. I should emphasize that what I'm talking about is really a collaboration across several people, uh, different UC campuses, and uh, the Forest Service, and and uh, and other other uh, entities. What I'm going to try to cover. What I am going to cover in, in today's indicated by these three bullets on my slide, some of the current water issues, uh, how that relates to forest management, and then what we're doing really to build the knowledge base to inform or help inform uh, management decisions around uh, at the intersection of uh, water, forest, and climate. So first, uh, current uh, water issues, and, and thanks to uh, Adam Mazurkowitz from Hetch Hetchy for this uh, rim fire photo from last year, which is in the, the Granite Creek uh, area, high severity burn. As researchers, uh, we get some recurring questions around forests and water. Uh, fires, of course, prompt questions about how will the post-fire water yield differ after the fire from before the fire. Uh, also, uh, everybody's thinking about what will be the water yield with climate warming versus today. We've seen lots of scenarios on that, but when we get down to actually what's happening on the ground in a specific basin, uh, we you know, beyond the scenarios. And third, uh, what was the historical water yield prior to fire suppression? People want to know what's the impact of the past uh, century of uh, fire suppression activities in the Sierra Nevada and other areas. And you know, I'm a hydrologist, so I turn around and ask uh, questions of the, my forestry colleagues, well, some background questions. Uh, how different were the forests prior to fire suppression versus today, uh, both pre-fire and post-fire? And also, can we take forests back to pre-fire suppression conditions, or just what conditions are we? aiming for. Now, here's a couple of photos uh, from a, a book I think people have, people have probably seen George Gruel's book, uh, the title is something like Fire in the Sierra Nevada, where he has at least half a dozen shared photos from areas uh, that around, uh, this one's 1890 uh, or 1900 time period areas that were not affected by either logging or, or fire as compared to today. And uh, at least from these photos, one can see significant differences in forest density. This photo is from, set of photos is from the Feather River. Here's a set from the uh, American River. And he's got several others in his book. So there is obviously a density difference in the forest uh, today versus a century ago. and that that difference is affecting the water cycle, the water balance uh, in the forest. Actually, our historical data compared with uh, recent data, here's a, some uh, summary data from a paper by Brandon Collins and, and colleagues. On, on the uh, left is a indication of uh, tree density uh, stems per acre, some of the 1911 data. And these, these are in the Stanislaus National Forest Yosemite area, which includes some of the rim fire area. A little over 20 trees per acre uh, versus uh, historically a 1911 survey versus present uh, approaching 100 trees per acre. Uh, in terms of total biomass, it's only about double present versus uh, 1911. And that's uh, of course, indicates that there's lots of small trees out there. So we have both, both you know, photographic and survey indications. Now, let me 
jump into some uh, topics in really the water and forest management, which is the core of the, the science part that I wanted to, to mention today. <coughs> uh, in 2011, several colleagues from uh, Berkeley, Merced, and uh, Environmental Defense issued this uh, basically literature review or forest water uh, scoping report. And in it, there's three main issues related to forests and water. One is water use by vegetation, that is vegetation of different densities. Uh, what are the interception losses in, uh, in forests, in receiving rain and snow, in the snow precipitation is what we covered. And then how does uh, forest uh, structure forming forest density affect the timing of snow melt? and the runoff, and all this of course, in a climate warming uh, or climate change context. So again, the trees and snow, uh, trees affect uh, accumulation and melt because trees block the low angle sun, which can retard snow melt. But you have to get the snow to the ground. Trees intercept some of the trees intercept a significant amount of snowfall, some of which sublimates, some of which melts and drips to the ground or falls to the ground. Uh, and trees also are, are dark, so they absorb solar radiation and emit it as heat or long wave radiation, resulting in tree wells, uh, you know, uh, preferential melting around, around trees because they're warmer. The photo on the, on the left of this panel shows some of our instrumentation. These, these, I believe, are along Tioga Pass Road. This is a snow sensor, so we're measuring snow depth. This one's at the drip edge. The one behind it is under the canopy, and uh, we also measure in the open. So there's, there's significant differences in snow accumulation depending on where you are in the forest, and we're measuring that at, at many locations in the Sierra Nevada, They're trying to document quantitatively uh, this effect. Now this uh, air photo with polygons drawn on it shows uh, a uh, experiment done at Stanislaus Twal in the experimental forest. Eric Knapp is the lead PSW researcher and we're collaborating with him on that. You see here some uh, polygons labeled control, meaning there was no thinning done. Some labeled variable and some labeled even, meaning that uh, even thinning is sort of like, I guess, removing every other tree. Again, I'm not a forester, but that's, that's the basic idea. Variable thinning is a patchy or clumpy uh, structure is what results, and you can see larger openings in the variable thinning. In uh, last year, 2013, we did a snow survey around the time of peak accumulation, and uh, the, the uh, bar chart on, on the right shows that, in fact, yes, there is more snow accumulation in the thinned uh, catchments as compared, or thinned polygons as compared to those um, that were in the control area. <laughs> Notice that it was pretty uh, light snow year, which is only about, in this case, 45 centimeters of snow versus 35 centimeters of snow. Percent Percentage-wise, that's a significant difference. Uh, so. I should know we went back about two weeks later, and most of the areas were melted out. So it wasn't a great year to do a, a snow survey. This year was even worse, though. We, uh, we got one snow survey and still working up the data on that. Now, for these differences between the variable, between the thinned areas and the, and the control, is that areas in the open, no matter where they are, accumulate more snow areas in a closed canopy accumulate much less snow. So again, showing the difference uh, that canopy, a dense canopy on, on snow accumulation. And we've, this was 1200, a 1200 measurement survey. We've done um, surveys at several other locations and find basically comparable uh, results uh, in the Southern Sierra. This is a photo from uh, that Eric Eric Knapp took in the Stanislaus area after the thinning. 
the foreground is what some of my uh, colleagues, um, particularly uh, uh, silviculture colleague uh, Kevin O'Hara at, at Cal, Cal Berkeley, calls uh, more of a restored forest, the sort of tree density you would expect to see uh, 100 to 150 years ago. And in the background is, is a forest that is a current uh, condition. Another photo of a, from an, an, one of the even thinning plots. Again, a tree density then was there historically, but this is still after thinning, removal of somewhere between a third to half of the biomass, according to Eric's uh, preliminary numbers. And this is a, a variable thinning where you have a more of a patchy uh, uh, treatment at the Stanislaus Tuolumne. Now I want to go to a little bit of basic hydrology. I'm going to simplify hydrology to a, a water balance equation uh, where precipitation comes in uh, to, a, to an area and it either uh, is transpires that is used by, by trees and plants and sent back to the atmosphere or evaporates and I'm lumping those together evap evaporation and transpiration, what I call evapotranspiration or it leaves the area as runoff. So again, measurement of snow, uh, snow cover via satellite or rainfall and snowfall via precipitation gauges, and uh, measurement of evapotranspiration and, and uh, runoff or stream flow. First, I'm going to just touch on precipitation. Now we've all seen these maps of, uh, that show the amount of precipitation in the state, or in these, these are subsetted for the Sierra Nevada. And then we see that there is, in fact, a difference by about a, by, precipitation drops by about a factor of three as you go from the north to the south in the Sierra Nevada, with snowfall remaining roughly the same as you go from north to south, or maybe a little higher in the south snow accumulation. That's because, of course, the mountains are higher in the south. But I call these climatological estimates, that is, average estimates, because, in fact, we don't measure precipitation at very many places in the Sierra Nevada. So basically, we're not, some, we're not sure how much precipitation occurs, especially at the higher elevations, because we're extrapolating from lower elevations. So here's a basic problem. When we start to do a water balance, we don't actually have good data on uh, the fundamental input, which is precipitation. Nevertheless, so let me proceed to the next term, which is runoff, or stream flow. Now, one thing, uh, before I show some stream flow uh, values for the Sierra Nevada, and, and uh, I wanted to just introduce where some of these uh, data are coming from. This is a satellite image of snow-covered Sierra Nevada, Central Valley uh, to the left. And each of these uh, small open circles shows an instrumented catchment or watershed where uh, my colleagues and I are, are working. And I want to highlight two of those, the Southern Sierra Critical Zone Observatory, which is co-located with the Kings River Experimental Watershed, a, a US Forest Service research site in my my colleague, uh, Carolyn Hunsaker, who's the lead on the, on the CREW project, will be uh, talking as, uh, later as in part of this, this symposium. So the data I'm going to jump to are from the CREW, or main CZO site, here in the southern Sierra Nevada, north fork of the Kings River. Now CREW has eight instrumented headwater catchments, four are uh, called Providence. They're at the rain snow transition elevation, roughly 5,000 to 6,800 feet elevation. And uh, four are up in the snow zone, referred to as the bull catchment. So a nice elevation transect of catchments here with about a uh, 600 meter or 2,000 foot difference in elevation, going from largely more rain dominated at the lowest elevations to completely snow dominated at the highest elevations. Now, uh, I'm introducing a, a graph here. I'm, uh, 
sorry for some people don't like graphs, but I, I think I have what's stated in, in words here too. Basically, you get an increase in water yield with elevation. Elevation is along the horizontal axis of the abscissa, going from roughly uh, 6,200 feet average elevation of the lower catchment up to about a little over 8,000 feet elevations of the higher elevation catchment. And this is discharge divided by precipitation, or fraction of the precipitation that leaves as, uh, as runoff. For two dry years, 2004 and 2007, Two wetter years, 2005 and 2006. What I want you to see is that the slope goes up as you go up in elevation, meaning that you get more runoff at higher elevations in both wet years and dry years. Now, that's, uh, I'll come to why that's uh, so and as we go on, but just to note this trend and also note that if then one increases temperature, a, uh, you know, two degrees Celsius, which means you're moving up a thousand, two, a thousand feet in elevation. You're going to get, you know, move this uh, curve to the left and get less runoff. It's climate warming. Now I want to go to evapotranspiration, which is really controlling that difference. And again, I refer to evapotranspiration as being the sum as evaporation from the soil or or, or uh, snow and uh, or plus water use by vegetation, and the, the dominant term is water use by vegetation in these forests. Again, the uh, map of the uh, research infrastructure, and I, I'm going to focus on this elevation transect of closed circles, which go from the oak savanna at the lower elevation up through the red fir transition at the higher elevation. Here are the, uh, some photos and characteristics of those sites. The lowest elevation is the uh, San Joaquin Experimental Range, precipitation about 500 millimeters per year, no snow, it's all rain, uh, oaks about uh, you know 11 meters or uh, so in height. Then we, the second and third uh, sites up this transect are in the mixed conifer forest, the pine oak, mixed pine oak at the lower up to a true mixed conifer at the higher. And at each of these sites, we have a tower that extends above the canopy. And on the tower, there are instruments that measure how much water is leaving the forest and also how much carbon is taken up, carbon dioxide is taken up by the trees and other vegetation. And then at the highest elevation, we're up in the subalpine, or mainly uh, more red fir, and it's largely snow dominated. The mixed conifer is a mix of rain and snow, maybe a little more snow than rain. Pine oak forest is m more rain than snow, a little bit of snow, but it doesn't stick around long. When you're able to see rain at the lower elevation. Now, again, a graph. This is a very important graph, so I want to dwell on it for just a moment here. These uh, squares on here represent a year's worth of evapotranspiration measurements from those sites. The oak savanna, the mixed conifer, two mixed conifer sites, and the red fir transition. Now, note there's lower values at the oak savanna because basically they, uh, it's water limited. It, it, you, basically, all the water that comes in as rain goes back out as evapotranspiration, except for maybe some uh, you know, big rainstorms where you do get a little bit of, of, of quick runoff. And that's largely true at the second site where you go up. Most of the uh, precipitation is used, is stored in the soil, and, and uh, there's a little bit of stream flow, but most of it goes back out as evapotranspiration. So again, at these two lower sites, not much runoff. You start to get a lot of measurable runoff when you go up to the mixed conifer, because precipitation is increasing along this elevation transect. Evapotranspiration 
uh, you know, is, is pretty high here in the mixed conifer, then it drops off at the highest elevation because it's too cold in the winter and the trees shut down. So a shorter growing season. So we get our most runoff from the highest elevations, the snow-dominated short growing season uh, period. So again, most of the runoff is coming from these higher elevations in the Sierra Nevada. <coughs> we call these this mixed conifer zone the sweet for mixed conifer, or I uh, sometimes like to call it the happy zone for trees because it's not too dry. There's a lot of subsurface storage for water, soil water storage. And it's, it's not too cold. That is, they can, some of the trees can uh, transpire year round. Some may shut down for short periods in the winter. Most of them will go year round. There's also quite a bit of, uh, because of the soil, deep rooting and resiliency to moisture stress, uh, we believe, in these areas. Now, uh, I want to go on to some points on really building the knowledge base and, and uh, what, what we're doing with some of these catchment scale studies at the intersection of water, forest, and climate. Uh, back to the literature review that I mentioned, the scoping study. Now, everybody has their own favorite uh, study to cite from the literature, from studies that have been done in catchments around the world, none of which were quantitative studies in the Sierra Nevada. Uh, my colleagues and I like to look at this study by Zhang et al., which was an analysis of a lot of uh, watershed studies around the world, uh, many in the western U.S., many in Australia, and so forth, which basically shows that for a given precipitation amount, let's take 1,000 millimeters, which is typical for the areas I was just talking about, as you reduce the vegetation, you get less of apple transpiration. Makes sense, huh? And, that, and that, that difference really depends on how the magnitude of that difference depends on how much precipitation there is. So these are average lines from lots of studies uh, around the world. And based on this, based on these studies, our hypothesis in that scoping report is that reducing forest cover by a maximum of by uh, 40% of maximum levels that you find in the Sierra Nevada can increase water yields by about 9%. That's a hypothesis based on a literature review. And if there were sustained extensive treatments in dense forests, that could increase water yield by up to 16%. But again, these estimates are not based on Sierra Nevada specific data. It's based on what we read in the literature. So let me jump to uh, a couple of these studies. Again, uh, the, uh, the the crew and uh, CZO studies, which I've mentioned already, uh, and these this is actually there was some thinning done there, and these are some uh, data that were available that were presented in a talk in. Remember, the final numbers on biomass removal are uh, not, not available uh, yet. And then the SNAP study, Sierra Nevada Adaptive Management Project, which had two sets of paired catchments, one up in the uh, Tahoe National Forest, one down in the Sierra National Forest, where we evaluated the impact of Sierra Nevada framework treatments on uh, water and other ecosystem services. <coughs> I just want to show the type of results we're getting because, again, the actual numbers of mass removal are not available yet. So this graph shows, um, again, a bar chart showing percent biomass removal. So current conditions are at zero biomass removal. And the lower part of the bar is the amount of runoff part is the amount of evapotranspiration. This is a four-year average uh, using data. And then using hydrologic modeling, we project the expected change in flow and evapotranspiration with biomass removal. So again, these are projections not yet verified 
by any uh, data, but this is the direction that we're headed. And I should note the SNAP project is in its last year, so these uh, results are within a few months. So the basic question is, what's the slope of this line, or how do you change the partitioning of water between uh, evapotranspiration and stream flow as you change the biomass at various locations in the Sierra Nevada? Because it is going to be a different response depending on uh, where you are. Yeah. Um, the, uh, those ongoing studies to a couple of opportunities. I call these low-hanging fruit for getting data to extend this sort of modeling and actually verify some of the impacts of forest thinning. First, th this map shows uh, the recent fires, including the American fire up in the um, Middle Fork of the American River Basin. Uh, the American fire went through the SNAP watershed, which were in the, the last chance. Uh, project area, as the Forest Service calls it. There are two headwater catchments for hydrology studies. One was inside the uh, fire perimeter, and one was outside. The control was actually outside, so it was untouched. The thin catchment was inside. It had largely moderate, low to moderate severity burns. So the fire actually did a little bit more vegetation removal. I consider this really low-hanging fruit for getting additional data to extend and verify the sort of analysis represented uh, on, on, uh, on this study. Really answer to the questions about what is the impact of vegetation uh, management, what's the impact of fire on, on, uh, on the water cycle and on runoff. So we've actually added some more instrumentation out in this area as uh, to, to try to pick up on that, although we, we don't yet have a, uh, a firm uh, funding source to be able to continue the, uh, the work because the SNAP project is winding down this year. So that's an opportunity for uh, continuing, but it needs, it needs a sponsor. The second opportunity, uh, my colleague uh, uh, at Cal Berkeley, Scott Stevens, and uh, and others, uh, and uh, we're, uh, our group's expecting to, to collaborate because we have a, a student working in, the, in this area also, is, is the uh, Illouette Basin, uh, which is down here on the right. Uh, Scott tells me that because of the multiple fire entries that have occurred there in the last uh, few years to decades, the Illouette Basin has now a vegetation density that's closer to a historical uh, pre-fire suppression value than uh, to the rest of the forest around it. So I think this is a, you know, a, a natural opportunity to really pick up some of these questions about what is the water yield and, and runoff from a restored forest. A third potential opportunity in the rim fire area, uh, my concern about is that it's largely uh, rain, more rain dominated than snow dominated, so there's probably less to for, uh, for water yield gains, although it does need to be evaluated. We've added, our, our group has added some more sensors uh, after, after the fire, and we had several sensors in uh, already, both in and above the, uh, the rim fire uh, area and some uh, uh, upgrades there with, uh, again, a team in our group working on this. Now, uh, let me jump to some of the new studies that are proposed. These uh, photos are a transition, but they also show some of the modular uh, design that we have for when we instrument catchments for uh, this sort of work, enabling fairly low-cost uh, deployment and, and uh, and uh, sensing of some uh, standard instrument packages that we've developed and deployed to several locations in the Sierra Nevada. <coughs> First is the Frenchy project. After discussions with uh, Tom Quinn and Victor Lyons in the, in the Tahoe National Forest have 
resulted in identifying the, the Frenchie project, which is just, of course, just east of the uh, SNAP uh, study area as a potential study site. And we've uh, laid out four uh, headwater catchments here that have uh, streams in them and the sort of uh, experimental design that we would envision with one being a restored, uh, that is restoring one catchment to the uh, forest densities that were present uh, 100, 150 years ago. Uh, in this case, two controls, and then a, a, an area that would receive lighter thinning, sort of a halfway in between control and, and restore. The challenge here, though, is if you notice, some areas are shaded green, some areas are shaded white. The white are private land. So uh, w one still needs to you know, make sure that the private landowner is willing to cooperate in the study, and, and those discussions really haven't, uh, haven't started yet. Uh, we're researchers, so we're, again, hoping that some uh, colleagues who do the thinning can help uh, put this project together with the private landowner. That we became aware of uh, opportunity that we became aware of after the um, uh, district ranger uh, uh, in the uh, in the Sierra, I mean in the Stanislaus National Forest, uh, mentioned is going forward as hemlock project, uh, and this was this resulted from a meeting that was a public meeting that was held up in uh, San Andreas in January. The nice thing, we haven't visited here yet. We're hoping to get out as soon as the uh, snow goes off the roads and lets us. But the nice thing is there's six, potentially six catchments that we uh, see here that are pretty much all on uh, Forest Service land. So other, some other potential projects, uh, areas that have been discussed. And uh, again, we're having multiple discussions because we're, we're not sure which one's going to be able to provide the best uh, study site. We're hopeful that uh, you know, the, the, the Frenchie, or if not, the Hemlock Project could be that. But some other discussions, people that have approached this include some po po uh, possible catchments on Sierra Pacific lands. Our phase one uh, scoping report that I mentioned earlier evaluated the Onion Creek uh, catchments in the Tahoe Forest. These are very dense. It's an experimental area was set up for ecology studies, but it's never Research has never taken place there. Uh, there it's ideal, but there may be institutional constraints that uh, limit uh, doing research there. But uh, still to be determined. The sage hen area has been suggested, and we've talked to both the Forest Service and the Truckee Donner uh, Land Trust. Um, it is the east side. It may not be representative of the west side. Uh, it's possible, but we've really put this as a lower lower priority because of some of the um, <coughs> physical uh, and uh, landscape constraints on uh, getting a representative site. We've done a scoping study up in the Scott uh, River uh, area of the Klamath Forest, and that's posted uh, on the website of the Northern California Resource Center up in Fort Jones. Uh, Right now, there's no really uh, thinning project planned. Uh, it's going to be a multi-year planning effort, and we'll see what's there. We've had a lot of great conversations with people, but haven't identified any specific sites uh, in the El Dorado National Forest, where I think there's also you know, good potential for our research project to go in to address these uh, water uh, forest management research questions. So I just wanted to uh, leave you with a, a research summary about the you know, high evapotranspiration across a wide swath of the mixed conifer forest and how that affects runoff. There is a fair bit of resiliency to moisture stress that we found in this area. And the water yield is fairly low in the rain zone from our uh, measurements at the critical zone observatory site. Much higher in the snow-dominated uh, areas due to the shorter growing season and, uh, and uh, subsurface storage. Both the literature and our studies to date show that sustained forest management, suggest that for sustained forest management can provide immeasurable benefits for water supply. Um, sustained forest management 
even within the constraints of things like GTR 220 that the uh, PSW and others have, have published. But it will require both investment, uh, maybe a different level of investment than has gone uh, to date, where you just go in once every 20 years and do some, some thinning. You've got to really control the vegetation if you want to control evapotranspiration. And it will require verification. If you're asking people to make investments, especially downstream users, they're going to want to get verification of the benefits, which means measurement. You can't just model your way through this. You need real measurement and data. And finally, you know, better information is, that is based on measurements is critical for water management, not only for forest, the forest but also for other uh, you know, water supply and, and uh, both operation and planning. So again, I want to just acknowledge my colleagues, and uh, thank you for letting me present some of our work and, and, uh, and thoughts on this process.